guys, welcome to the Be Legendary podcast, uh, starring Bill Gillespie. We're introducing him to the team and uh, a great friend of ours. We also have Brandon Lilly, who you very well know if you listen to the podcast, and I'm Bill Soren. Um, really, really cool uh, today. Today was Squattober PR party. Uh, we got Bill down with us. We got uh, Brandon drove in from Kentucky, and and uh, you know, a somewhat new teammate of ours, Brandon, for three years maybe mm-hmm. or so. Uh, Bill is, is new to the team. Uh, I want to first welcome you here, Bill. Thank you. And uh, give us, I want to kind of give the, the, the listeners a little bit more of, uh, we're going to, you've been someone in my life that I've known you for close to 20 years, and you've been a mentor in many ways. You've been a peer. I, uh, I'll say I, I push myself to hopefully be a peer of yours, but we've been we've had some great conversations about training over the years. You've not only been a strength coach, master strength coach for thirty five years, world champion in the bench press, and and many other powerlifting endeavors, multiple world time world record holder, current world record holder, but more importantly, your love and and you're so dialed into the strength game, but not only. The thing that I think separates you is it's not only that you love it and you've been around it, you figured out ways to hack the system and and produce amazing results. And that's the thing that I've always been <clears throat> super excited to talk with you about at conferences and shows, is you always seem to figure out a way to reduce negative variables and to always win. And so we want to talk about that a little bit because I'm we had to stop our conversation we had earlier today probably 20 times because you'd go down this rabbit hole that I, I so wanted to dig down there with you, but I wanted to catch it because it's so great to hear the first time. Um, but first, tell us a little bit about yourself and uh, and then so bring some context to what we're going to talk about and uh, then we'll jump right in because I can't wait to talk to you. Well, I, 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 I love, like you said, I love to lift weights. I don't remember a time in my life where I didn't want to be strong. Uh, my mother used it against me to do yard work, to get me to clean, you know, rake the leaves or whatever, because <laughs> it built my muscles up. As soon as I knew there was such a thing as muscles, I wanted to be strong. And um, it's a pursuit that I've had my whole life. <clears throat> In my mind, I have a few things that I, I, the way I think. One is, is I like to exhort other people. I like to make other people bring out their better qualities in them. I like to make people help people be the best they, that they can be. The other thing I'm, I, I'm good at is uh, how to make things more ergonomical. How to do the, a job the most effective way because I couldn't stand it as an athlete when coaches just made you do drills that made you tired. Mm. I'm like, I, I'm gonna get tired anyway. Right. You know? <laughs> so Jim, give me something that's gonna make me better, you know? And so um, as I would design workouts and for myself and for my athletes, I'm thinking, okay, what's gonna help them become their very best? And what's the most ergonomical way of maximizing my energy, taking into account all the aspects of going on in their life, whether it's in season, spring ball, uh, off season, I had to take all those things into account to understand what I needed to do to complement what they were doing in their work, right. to maximize so that I come. But I, I have this theory, and, and call me crazy, uh, but I think a football player should be their strongest during football season. Uh, I don't think it means anything to be strong in the off season. I'm not training uh, weightlifters. And um, I know I know that our time is limited during the season. We don't have as much time. I know that it's a difficult uh, to do, but I can tell you this, I've, I know that it can be done. In my last two years of coaching, I was able to be extremely successful in seeing the players lift more the la- at the last week of the season than they did before the season started. Why do you think coaches don't have that aim as, as a, you know, as a mm-hmm. collective? Well, I think we just kind of died in the wool. Yeah, I think as we've been told for so many years, we're going to try to maintain our strength. But what ends up happening, if you remember Carl Lewis, when they used to do the study, how he looked like he was accelerating right. the last 30 meters, mm-hmm. and he really wasn't, he just wasn't. Everyone else wasn't. Yeah, everyone else was decelerating, okay, even more. And so what I looked at is I said, okay, the last third and fourth of the season, if my guys can make even the smallest amount of progression, five pounds, it's not going to be significant, but what it's going to be is significant because 
everybody else is decelerating. You're widening that gap even exactly. more. Exactly. Now, let's, let me just give some context for the listeners. If they don't know who Bill Gillespie, so you coached at a few places. Mm-hmm. Uh, always been a, a always been a football strength coach. Is that correct? Yes. So tell, give us a, a, a couple of places that you your, your history of where you've been and kind of where you went from there. I went to school at Liberty University. I stayed there and coached. I actually started out as a track and field coach. Because you were a thrower there as well. I was a thrower. And then I went into uh, coaching strength and conditioning. In 1991, I went to the University of Washington. And I had the privilege of coaching there for 11 years. And then uh, I went to the Seattle Seahawks and was coaching there for two years. And um, the chancellor of Liberty University came to me when I was visiting and asked me to walk away from the NFL and come back to Liberty to coach, to help them to reach the dream that he had for the football program there. And uh, I saw it as a good situation for myself and my family and uh, gave my life purpose. So I did, I walked away from the NFL and went to Liberty and um, uh, helped them to become where, you know, their dream of the playing BYU and this year Mm -hmm. they get to play BYU, they're bowl eligible and and I helped them get the, you know, you know, be a part of that, you know. That's amazing. So. That's, that's amazing. And, and I know early in your career, you've had different parts uh, of your career where your lifting itself was extraordinary. I believe you you squatted. I don't work out. I did a thousand seven squat. And that was what year? That was in 1991. <clears throat> Let's just let it be noted that I am the strongest squatter in the room. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we'll just let that be noted. I got to get my points where I can get them. Trust me, great admiration. <laughs> so, a thousand, a thousand seven. Yes. And so, t- t- I've heard some cool stories about that. And so, that was walking it out, bar on the back to give us, yeah. so give us context. Yeah, that was the that. old school single ply. Old school knee wraps that just really didn't have much to offer. Let's let's you know. recalibrate and renote that yeah. uh, <laughs> Bill is now the strongest squatter in the room. <laughs> I was weighing about uh, two eighty three. Definitely the strongest squatter in the room. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I, I I wanted a thousand pounds before I left Liberty. I wanted it so bad. I was obsessed with doing it, and um, I knew that I was getting ready to leave. Uh, Liberty to go to the University of Washington and I knew it was going to be my last squat workout. So uh, you remember the beepers we wear on our legs from Bigger, Faster, Stronger and you get a little beep and you know you went low enough. Well I was wearing that to make sure I get myself low enough. Well I forgot to turn the thing on. So I'm squatting down just with everything I have and I'm going gosh (laughs) this thousand pounds you feel like you really got to squat deep and I just went beep and I finally crashed and I'm like Oh, here it is, my last squat workout. Man, I missed it. I didn't even get it, you know, I, I, I didn't even get low enough for it to beep. Then I looked down and I didn't turn the thing on. And I'm like, oh, <laughs> gosh. And everybody thought I was done, you know. I'm like, man, I ain't, I'm no way. I'm not going to walk away. So I loaded the weight back on the bar. And uh, I, I was determined I was going to get it. You know, there, there's some things that happen when you squat a thousand pounds, which I'm sure you're aware of, but I wasn't. And, uh, I, and I still am not. Yeah. <laughs> One is uh, breathing, okay? Uh, you don't breathe like you do with a regular squat, okay? You don't go and stand there, walk back, and go, okay? okay? You can't do that. Well, I found out the hard way, all right? So I go, and that's all the air I got. So, and when you go down, you go down, at least half the speed. I mean, you could barely tell I was moving when I was going down. And when I came up, I was going so slow, you didn't even know I was moving. And I got about three quarters of the way up, and I'm like, I don't have no more air, man. I'm, I'm gonna pass out, man. And I thought, no, I'm squatting this thousand pounds, man. And I, I straightened out my legs. Um, I don't really remember much after that. The spotters grabbed the bar, they got the bar in the rack. I fell on the ground, uh, went into convulsions, started puking blood, and uh, everybody's like, oh no, God, you know, we've got an emergency. I'm like, nah, it's all right, I'm all right. I, they're like, <laughs> I said, I was all happy. They're like, what's your problem? I'm like, dude, I squatted a thousand pounds. <laughs> <laughs> so how long did they give you before you did your next set? 
Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it sounded like you were just warming up, man. Yeah. <laughs> oh, man. That's so, incredible. So, yeah, I, I, I have a great admir- admiration for anybody squatting those big weights. Jeez. That's and now, now you've been lifetime drug-free, is that Yes, right? I am a lifetime drug-free athlete. My passion, like I said, is the ergonomics of, of training. I want to know what is the best way to train. And, and I knew that if I took drugs, then I would not find that out, you know? And so I wanted to know how to get strong. And right. I was really frustrated because I would go and find out that so many of the articles of the guys that would pull, publish these articles about training were telling the truth. They didn't do these workouts, they didn't do anything like it. And I'm like, okay. And so your father and I and some other notable uh, um, uh, uh, lifters and coaches went to Gregory Goldstein in 1991 with Johnny Parker up the New York Giants and he sat there for three days and answered every question we ever wanted to know and, and I still and Goldstein was from from Russia from right? Russia yes right. and I sat one there one of the first times a Russian coach ever came over oh, and brought any of that information any of it was, right? I mean, that it, was that was like the Mayflower coming yeah up. It, what people don't understand is that is nowadays is that we didn't have the internet mm. Right. The information was priceless at that point in time. It was Absolutely, very hard to get a hold of. And um, you know, he got up there and he said uh, he said something really profound. He said he said that it would take him uh, forty hours to write up a four week routine. And I leaned over to the guy next to me. I'm like, "What's he do the other thirty seven hours?" You right, know, right. like, "Come on, there's no way." After the three days he got done, I started playing with it. and I went. That's impossible. There's no way you could get it done that fast. It was so complex. And I sat there and I, you know, and some of the other coaches were like, well, you know, that's just too much work and blah, blah, blah. And I thought, no, you know what? They're on to something, okay? Mm -hmm. They had thousands of subjects and they experimented with tons of different people. And um, the basic principles, there's application to it. And so what I started doing was I started working on it. I started developing a system and started uh, uh, coming up with a different way of doing it. And it took me a little while, but um, eventually um, I decided I'm gonna, I'm gonna, my bench was horrible, okay? I, I came out of college and I went to the first drug-free national championships in 1983 and benched. 391 pounds and did not have a bad day. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, I was, in fact, it was before the round system. Mm. Okay. Oh, so you were lifting after yourself. Yeah, I was lifting after myself. So I took my first, my second, and my third attempt, and then they loaded on the bar 35 pounds more for the second <laughs> first guy to do his first attempt. I was so bad. And then, uh, you know, at the age of 35, I'm benching 440, 450. You know, and you're thinking, you know that's as good as you're going to get and i said you know what i'm going to reinvent how to train the bench press i'm i'm i've been exposed to some of these great coaches and i says and there's it's, there's got to be a better way to do it and so i started i just i started just sat there while my kids were playing in the playground i'm sitting there trying to design a new way of doing it and um i i, I, I my bench went crazy um, from from the time of roughly thirty five, it just yeah, been climbing. From thirty five, it's just been going up. And, and you're up. now sixty. I'm sixty years old. Turned sixty a month ago, and I'm hitting some. The, no, I'm not. I'm hitting the biggest weights of my life by far. Because you just was your most recent record that you benched. Well, if officially, I benched nine hundred and fifteen pounds in, <laughs> in a meet, and yeah. was mad that I didn't get the nine fifty three because I thought I deserved it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but. Uh, uh, I, in my workouts, I'm hitting huge numbers in my workouts. I went down to a half board and did a thousand pounds. Uh, a week ago, I did uh, eight hundred and two point five pounds for ten reps. Yeah, you know. So well, and let's let's just clarify a half board. There's a system of, of thought where you would use boards to shorten the distance or the shorten the range of motion. And a lot of people in a bench shirt type situation versus raw, sometimes it's used raw for tricep extension, but you'll have a four board, then you work to a three board and progressively down. Mm-hmm. A half board is literally a half an inch away from touching your chest. Yeah. Yeah. And it's, it's something that 
at that level with that amount of weight, if you can do that, you're almost certain that you can do the last. Exactly right. Yeah. And that's why I didn't want to go and um, take any chances of getting injured. I just needed to know what was a thousand pounds going to feel sure. like. So I saw the videos and, and what people don't realize is that when you're talking about those kind of weights or even relative to your max, whatever somebody listening to this max is, that last half inch is where the the opportunity for injury accelerates mm -hmm, mm -hmm. to a great extent. That's why you see a lot of times there's this big debate between, you know, squat depth for athletes versus squat depth for powerlifting. You know, do we need to take athletes that deep? Because oh, say that about the bench press. Yeah, exactly. I mean, yeah. there's always the debate, but we do know that the further a muscle moves and a tendon moves, the more, the more the angle. Exactly. So. The, you basically did a thousand pounds in training. How good do you feel about that right now? I mean, I'm pretty excited. You know, I I I can't wait to get in a meet. Mm -hmm. You know, I you were five weeks out and it canceled, right? Yeah, five days. Five days. Like, okay. Five days out and they canceled the meet. Oh. So I was ready. Now I got to regroup and now I got. You're not a guy that puts a little bit of effort into no, getting ready. No, this whole me. life. You yeah. know, you know, I, I love the hunt and I'm like, can't go hunting. Got a, got a meet coming up. Got to stop my hunting. Uh, my the way I manipulate my body weight is based on the meat. So I like to go and get leaner during the off season, and then the last two three weeks before the meet, I try to eat as much as I can and gain weight. And here, here I was going through that process. I was feeling strong, and now they do this to me. Now I got another meet coming up a week from this Saturday where I had to go and. Except go redo that whole schedule yeah. over again. So. How hard is that for you? I mean, it's obviously your frame of reference is only your life, but how hard is it for you to dedicate to the natural decision to stay that way, to compete against the open, mm -hmm. to to accept that somebody may or may not, whatever you want to look at it, have an advantage over you and still not mm -hmm. tip your toes into that water? Yeah, um, you know, uh, the, the, the only reason I don't is uh, because... Uh, I, 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 I don't know enough about it, to be yeah. honest with you. I'm pretty ignorant. And I'm concerned at my age that, um, that I might mess up my metabolism. And the fact of the matter is, oh, I'm doing pretty darn good without it. <laughs> well, I'll tell you, um, there's, there's a big name lifter. I don't, I don't want to put his name out there because I don't know the openness of his, of his life. But he shared some things with me. He was an IPF world champion and then started competing in the open and, and obviously had, had done it for health reasons. He got on some testosterone and that's when his injuries started. And that's what we were talking about before is the acceleration of tendon breakdown and things like that with some of these, you know, steroids or anabolics that people take. And I think you were pretty wise to that. If that was the first response you gave me when we were talking about it loosely outside, he popped right into my mind and I was like, I mean, he was phenomenal, 650 raw bencher. Um, and it was drug tested, I think, as heavily as, as anyone else in the world. Maybe Blaine Sumner might be the only guy drug tested more. Mm -hmm. um, but to, to hear him say that the ill effects far outweighed the wonder of, of what it might do, I mean, it destroyed him as a lifter. Yeah. It, well, it, it, the thing you've got to focus on, too, is, is it's not just the number, mm -hmm. okay? The process is of more value than the, the number. The process is what the focus is because it's that that process is what it, it, it increases my quality of life. Yeah. You know, uh, getting underneath that bar uh, month in month out. I rec uh, a couple years ago had my uh, 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 tested for my ability to focus, mm -hmm. and the guy says, "Oh my gosh, you you have no fear." Yeah. Like I'm sitting in a room, you know, getting this test done, and he goes, "No, no, 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 no." He goes. Uh, he says you because you know you have the what you have to do to get mentally prepared for this big lift week in week out he says he goes your ability to stay just focused is beyond world class wow. and he goes uh, let me ask you a question he says how does caffeine affect you and I'm like oh gosh caffeine when I lift weights uh, 12 hours he goes no 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 it's not the caffeine he says, your ability to focus is beyond anything we've ever seen before, and the caffeine takes you to a level that's incomprehensible. 
and to come down from it is the problem. Is you mm-hmm. can't unwind from it because you become you go to such an intense level uh, so in your like mind. A hyper focus of yeah. just that, that, that's yeah. sustainable. Yeah, but the thing is, is what's so great is that is that we assume because we've we, we we've been through this and we think this way that that all of a sudden. Uh, everybody else is that way, but right. we actually, there's some benefits in my life that I have because of the experience of all these uh, failures. Because I mean, come on, you know, you know, it ain't all victories. Sure, you know, <laughs> <laughs> there's a lot, you know, there's a lot of failures out there. I mean, I got there's a lot of bad days, yeah. and uh, you know, and, and and there have been lots of times where you sit there and think. Man, it's over. It's over. I'm never going to ever. But you know what? I, I, I've been able to go and I get on my knees and start praying. And God, help me. Show me. Uh, I can't get over this wall. I can't go left and right and compromise. How do I get through this wall? And God just says, here, what about this? I never thought of that. Right. You know? And that's where all the creative ideas come into play that helps me understand the big picture of how it, it all goes together. And so the, is, is when I hit these roadblocks, and I mean, I, I seriously, I've been, there's sometimes I hit roadblocks for two years, mm-hmm. and I'm just pounding my head going, there's got to be an answer. Mm-hmm. But you know, eventually the, I, some answer comes right. to me, and I figure it out. And so now all of a sudden, oh, when they, so what happens after a while, you start to think what's common isn't so common. Right. Yeah, and that's sort of some of the stuff we were talking about before is you have just very interesting ways to train some of your athletes or train yourself that, mm-hmm. I mean, just talk to you about some of the super heavy dips and then some of the different power clean mm-hmm. protocols. And, I, and so I want to kind of dive into some of those that are just, they, they've been over the years things that when you say them, it, they, there's certainly, you, you and I talked today, you're like, I'm just surprised that other people don't know this stuff. Yeah. I don't know what they know or they don't know. <laughs> yeah. and, and I just go, it, it, to me, it's just wild because I love, I love hacks. Yeah. I love life well, hacks. When people ask me, what do you bench raw? And I'm like, you don't get it. Yeah. You know, you don't understand. And they're like, well, what do you mean? Well, for me to focus on bench pressing raw, more weight, would take away from me benching with the shirt. Right. Because the technique that you bench raw is, is completely different than what you do with the shirt. So when I bench raw, I have to bench to, to subsidize my shirt bench. It doesn't matter how much I bench raw. In fact, if I put, like, like we were talking about doing the heavy dips, I did uh, six dips with uh, eight 45 pound plates, all right, back in the day. That was really good. The problem was, only thing I did was get good at doing dips. Right. It didn't transfer to my bench press. It wasn't until I dropped down to two 45-pound plates that it transferred to my uh, bench press. I said the same exact thing about good mornings when I was at mm-hmm. Westside. Louis had uh, requested that I do just a... I'd stumbled on the deadlift. I'd just been hitting block after block, kind of like what you were talking about. Mm-hmm. And he suggested really focusing on the good mornings. Well great video comes out of that. I do a 710 uh, good morning for two and then I think I eventually did a a 600 or a 630 um, good morning squat Mm -hmm. and we touched our butt to a 10 at squat and stood up with a camera bar Mm -hmm. and um, like you I go back to my deadlift and my deadlift's actually gone down but only when I started doing seated good mornings with like 185, 205 and 225 in a wave Mm -hmm. and really holding and maximizing the recruitment of the muscle and not just leveraging. I got really, really good at leveraging weight Mm -hmm. instead of recruiting muscle to lift the weight. Yes. And when I started to piece that one together, Mm -hmm. um, not to undo anything that Louie had said or taught me, but that's when the cube kind of started to come into me, much like you're saying for yourself, mm-hmm. you have to look as an athlete at some point in time. I always think athletes need coaches, always. Mm-hmm. But I think your input as an athlete can help your coach further you as the athlete. You have to self-coach to some level too, right? Yes, you do. Yes, and I mean, how much of your training has evolved into your own monster, so to say, mm-hmm. but how much outside support do you look for in that as well? Yeah, yeah. I always have to have my training partners. I, yeah. I don't want yes men. I could get, you know, right. you know, I want to go, hey, I got, you know, I'm going to ask a question, you know, yeah. I need it back, but you're absolutely right, you know? Well, and I, I just look at a lot of things like that too. Training partners, I, I think, you know, Mark Miller, when I was at Iron Mafia, um, Weston at Iron Mafia, those guys, I mean, there were, everybody there was accountable. Josh Morris, I don't know if you've heard of him, but he's, he's a phenomenal, he's a 2,400 pound raw guy. 
um, just amazing lifter. So I was lifting in that kind of talent pool, and as competitive as we were with each other, we were also like trying to help build each other because when Absolutely. you got stronger, Absolutely. I got hungrier. Yeah, you know. So yeah. who with a thousand pound bench press? Those aren't on every street corner. Well, so who's so who's pushing you? Okay, yeah. but right now I have two guys that compete in the IPF. Mm -hmm. All right, and and you know my numbers are higher than theirs. But <laughs> what I mentioned to them is that of all my IPF uh, uh, bench press competitions, I think I lead the United States in the worst performance ever. For uh, <laughs> I, I hold the record, okay? I think I've been in like seven or so IPF World Championships and I've made two attempts. Yeah. Okay, so when people talk about comparing Blaine and, and, and some of my friends, Joe Nalio, uh, Adam Amola, you know, these guys are, you know, the numbers that they're paid, putting up, I'm like, don't, no, no, uh-uh. They're, we're talking apples and oranges. Don't even, don't even insult me and, and, and make you know compare me to them because yeah. they, they're my heroes. Okay. okay. Yeah. What they, what they can accomplish, and and put up those in lifts and single ply shirts. Hey, I don't care if I do more than they do. I I know what I was able to do when I was there, and it wasn't what they're doing, you know. And I said, you know, you know, my friend Jonas, we're talking about him coming out and bench pressing uh, together at the conference. Yeah. And I says, I says, he goes, he goes, uh, you know, I can't wear your, your the shirt you're wearing. I'm like, I'll tell you what, we'll have a contest. You wear your four four gold medals, and I'll wear my one bronze medal, and that's the contest. Yeah, yeah. You know, like, <laughs> I said we'll put it in perspective. I, you know, because I mean, he, he, you know, he's my hero. You know, sure. but he because I understand the strict, uh, 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 how strict they are in the IPF. You know, uh, and and I can help them in their preparation, but they also help me yeah. in sharing ideas of. Here, this is some things I'm trying. <clears throat> here's some supplements I'm trying. Yeah. You know, here's some. This makes me feel good. This exercise I like. And they've, you know, Adam Amola is the most uh, decorated uh, bench presser in the United States history. He's a 205 uh, pound bench presser with a 725 pound bench press. Mm -hmm. And then uh, Jonah Leo, like I said, has won four gold medals in the super heavyweight class, wow. which is, hasn't been done. Oh, something you had said earlier, it's, it's, it's speaking of the bench, you had said the bench press, was it the most, uh, was, it, was it the most fickle or, or what, what, the fragile? Okay. Did you, well, what, no, what, what I said was, what I to get to was this, it was that uh, people talk to them about omega wave and all these systems to evaluate where you're at in your training. And the bench press is by far the easiest exercise to tell how much work you're doing in your workout. Okay. Really? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. As much more than a clean or anything. well, the the clean I can't go heavy on a clean. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, when I train the clean, my philosophy is that it's a dynamic lift, and I'm going to clean uh, explosively. I'm never going to mm -hmm. clean heavy. And just to let everybody know, uh, one year um, when I was coaching at Liberty, I had 84 players clean 300 or more in a single year. All right. That's incredible. And I had. 22 players clean over 400 pounds while I was there, and three of them over uh, 450 with the best uh, a 475 pound clean. Well, I'll always I'll always think that speed kills. I mean, oh, it, 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 it wins. It wins. If you can move heavyweight faster Fast. and faster and faster, mm -hmm. it doesn't take a genius to know you add a few more pounds and you're going to move it well. well and, and Josh Bryant puts it. I just want to go back to those numbers real quick. Like, well, yeah, I would just people, I, if people really <laughs> understand how heavy a 400 pound power clean is not a full squat clean a 400 pound yeah. power clean caught with slightly bent legs yep. for a non-olympic weightlifter college athlete yep. that's incredible i mean that is i've been around strong throwers my whole life all the guys that went to the olympics could all just about do that yeah but you're talking about i hate to say this liberty university no question fcs one double a football players one double a football players and how were those athletes again not Derogatory in no, any way. They not four star kids, right. not Alabama, no not in, right, no star kids were putting up that much weight. And they weren't weightlifters. No. They were football players. They were actually really good at football. Yeah. What I did was um, is is I took a page from Louie on deadlifting. 
and I realized that uh, I, I, when I was at the University of Washington, an all future all pro safety with the uh, 49ers, Tony Parrish, I said, Tony, I said, I need you to be my uh, guinea pig. Because we started to find that the players were, they had to get a new personal record while they were there. And so the players figured out that if they went heavy, they didn't clean as much on test day. They had to get a new personal record. <laughs> so I took Tony and I said, Tony, I want you to try doing this really light, clean workout for me. And I want to see how you do. And he went from 323 to 353 in one training session, I mean, uh, one training cycle. And I went, okay, ding, ding, the bell came on. So I, when I train my players to do cleans, I don't, I never go heavy. Uh, 80% is about the heaviest I go until it's time to test. Right. And then we go heavy. And um, the other thing I did was I changed the clean to not be an Olympic lifter, okay? Uh, when I say the clean is all about the hips, okay? And everybody goes, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm like, no, it's all oh, about yeah. the hips, all right? And so there's things like the shrug, okay? Everybody thinks you're supposed to shrug the weight up. I no, the, 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 You don't shrug the weight up. You're supposed to shrug to pull yourself down under the bar. So why in the world, if I'm not gonna be squatting under the bar, my guy's gonna be hitting a shrug? What ended up happening was, as they went to pull the, between their shoulder blades, they couldn't hold proper position. So their shoulders were rolling forward, then all the power in their hips and legs wasn't being transferred to the bar. Because it was pulling forward. Yeah, yeah. pulling them forward. Exactly. So what I did is I told them, I said, so I want you to do a pre-shrug. Before you pick up the weight, I want you to pull the shrug and hold it. Hold your upper back tight and hold your shoulders up. Basically, like you're cueing with me on the deadlift. Yeah, yeah, a hundred percent. And so what it, I told him, I said, I, I, I don't, I don't want you moving your feet. I want all about the hips. And all of a sudden, the weights just went boom. And um, <laughs> guys, <laughs> so basically, the opposite that almost every coach in America teaches to their football players that are usually happy with 300 to 350 pound power cleans and you're producing 350s and 400s and four oh no but I, I saw the video of the 475 that's one of the most incredible lifts yeah. i've ever seen yeah, yeah. Um, i mean nobody would even stop to watch a 350 clean okay <laughs> All right. i mean the guy that did the 475 pound clean we try to train him light and like there were days where in season he'd do 405 like it was a joke you know, it was just Jeez. so fast, so explosive. And that's producing so much force. Yeah, and I mean, that's the whole Because you can say what you want. Like, people are like, oh, well, is this technique, that technique. It's 400 yeah. pounds but see, fast. See, here's the thing. The clean, and I'm try, trying to explain <laughs> this to coaches and administrators. The clean is a representation of the summation of forces that you do in the entire weight workout. Okay? So when you see great cleans, it's not because, like the bench press, you focused on the bench press. You're seeing great cleans because everything else that you do in the clean in your workout is contributing to that kid. So it's almost bigger. a test more than it is a. It's a, yeah, it's a test an evaluation of my program because if I go and wow. over tax them and their backs and cores are fatigued and they're not explosive, they're not powerful, then it's going to show up on the clean. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> Now the bench press, as we were going to say earlier, is um, like we, you know, the mega wave where everybody wants to know what their training status is for the day. We found that the bench press is the most prolific uh, method of evaluating where you're at in your training. If, in fact, if if you if you watch a football player uh, during training camp, all right, watch them as they go in through the summer training camp and their benches are dropping. And they're going to tell you, oh, that's because training is too hard. The fact of the matter, that's not true. The, the, the football practice isn't too hard. The conditioning for the football practices wasn't hard enough. Why develop an artificial strength base in the off season that isn't going to be applicable and can carry over during football season? So if you're losing strength during football season, because football practice is too hard, either you didn't know the head football coach and what he was going to be asking of the players, or you didn't push the players hard enough in the, the offseason phase. In the conditioning phase. You uh, and I conditioned my players year round. 
all year round. Except, you know, during the season, football practice was their condition. Sure. But I never allowed a phase of training where there was an artificial base of strength developed that wasn't going to transfer it to could be replicated in the season. In season, yep. So, so you you put a lot of the money into the conditioning phase of it, and which is funny considering everyone sees you as a big, strong. Well, see, that's what's so fun. Yes, yeah. strength guy. Every, and you're talking conditioning. Yeah, if you look at how I approach it, you're going to move the bar fast. We're not going to train very high repetitions. We're not going to necessarily use very heavy weight, and we're going to do a lot of conditioning. You would go, well, there's no emphasis on strength development. But if you hear my numbers, you go. Well, you have too much emphasis on uh, numbers. I'm <laughs> right. <like>, no, <laughs> no. You can you can get both, and you have to. You yeah. know because it, it doesn't matter how strong you are before the football season starts. What matters is how strong are you when that football game starts. How strong are you in the fourth quarter? How strong are you at the last fourth of the season? That's what matters, because that's what's going to carry over to a successful football. It, it, at least give the football coaches a chance to be successful. You know, um, I, I'm going to tell you this story tomorrow in the a group, but uh, I had a baseball player at Washington come to me and say, hey, coach, I love what you do. Great stuff. But my slider, coach, it, I need I need some help with my slider. So I'm not going to be able to lift weights for a while because I'm going to go work on my slider. I'm like, oh, okay. I said, I, I, I got a favor I need to ask of you. He goes, what's that? I said, I got a flat tire. And I said, um, could you change that tire for me? I said, but I got three tools to get the job done. I got, I got a pair of pliers, a lug wrench, or one of them air guns. Which, which, which would you rather use? He goes, well, yeah, coach, if I cut the air gun, that's the one I would choose. I said, oh, okay. Only problem is I didn't ask you if you knew how to change a tire. I assumed you knew how to change a tire. I just wanted to know what tool you wanted to use. Sort of like your slider. I assumed you know how to throw a slider. I was just trying to change it from a pair of pliers to right. an air gun. Hell yeah. So, oh, that's great. So you, have, you, have, you have to break it down, especially for kids. Mm -hmm. You know, at college level, they think they know everything. And I think when you give them practicality like that, mm -hmm. it's a big inroad into gaining trust, but also keeping it honest and, yeah. and fun, too. Yeah. How come more coaches out there and I, I don't mean this as an insult to anyone in particular but kind of the profession as a whole why aren't there more coaches out there who are looking at things through the light of is this the best we can do it is there information out there counter to what we're doing mm -hmm. why aren't they processing more heavily like that I mean because in talking to you here and in talking to you out there everything within your life seems like I'm reassessing all the time. Right, constantly. 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 I'm never going to go and say, this is, because that thought process of doing it the most ergonomical way is constantly in my mind. It, I've learned that there's never, even if it might be perfect today, what's the next stage that I got to move to? You don't strike me as an intense guy at all. <laughs> Not at all. <laughs> but what happens is, is so many coaches feel, this is what I'm comfortable with. This is what, this has been a proven commodity right. and how it's done. And I can, I can defend myself in saying this is what everybody else is doing. Well, you know what I think a lot of coaches do, and this is something I've talked to just about every coach I've had on the podcast is, I don't want to go down this road today, but there's so much stress put on, I'm moving across country, but this is a new job, I've got to perform right off the bat. Mm -hmm. I think there's a safe approach to that where you know you can get results, you can stay well within that lane, mm -hmm. and so few coaches ever get to the point where it's like, Okay, this is my career. This is my home. Right. You I can know, break some eggs. I can break some eggs, yeah. Mm -hmm. I think it's a it's a real disservice to coaches that are thinkers. Mm -hmm. They get tied down. And no wonder there's so much burnout for some of these guys. Mm -hmm. You're taking somebody who's got a mind like yourself who was given the opportunity to run with it, and you're taking these guys and saying, no, nah, stay in your lane. Stay mm -hmm. in your lane. Can't deadlift here. you got to do cleans. Yeah. Can't do this. Got to do that. You know what I mean? Yeah. What do you think? What do you think the out for that is? Is it change within... You know what? Yeah, it's going to have to change within the profession. I think that uh, I think over time, I think people are starting to recognize the value of the strength coach. But for the most part, um, it is a human nature thing. It's like people see whatever is the value at that moment, and the value is what's going on during the game. Okay, so they see a strength coach, and he's just keeping guys back. Right. That's my value. Okay, but. 
I think that it would be really uh, great for people to see what goes on behind the scenes. I remember uh, I read a Chinese proverb that said, uh, remember when you're drinking a cup of cool water, remember those that dug the well. And that's the same thing with a strength coach. You know, uh, uh, I've had, I've had uh, head football coaches that understood the value of what I contributed to the football program, and they were very accommodating and helping me uh, to support me and give me time away when I needed it. Uh, but there are others, coaches, who just thought, just use them up for whatever I can get and um, take advantage of it. And that's where the burnout occurs. And there's, and there's no, you know, you go and you get to the celebrations and all of a sudden they're like, let's get the coaching staff a bonus and the strength coach is left behind. Let's get this, uh, yeah. well, and the strength coach is left behind. And yet, and yet I've seen in other situations where the strength coach is the number one guy for the uh, football coach. And in that situation, because always remember this, there's only two coaches on a football staff that work with the entire football team, the head coach and the strength coach. Mm-hmm. And I had a football coach stand up from the stand up in front of our football staff and said, "Remember that there's only two of us, and don't you ever forget it." Wow! Yeah, that was huge. Well, actually, my favorite staff we've talked about them a couple times uh, once at hunt camp and then today earlier. My favorite staff, like as a, as a whole, like I, I, when I walk in the room with those guys, I really enjoy being there. Mm-hmm. Um, they have that kind of dynamic. Mm-hmm. The head coach and like. Head coach is a reserve guy, quiet, kind of like, not passive, but just a very different personality than the, than the strength coach. Yes. So he comes to him and he kind of, they benefit one another. Yes. They talk to each other yes. and their system, it's going really, really well. And it works really, really well. And I don't know why more staffs, and I don't know if it's ego, I don't know what it is, well, but it's, it a, it's be a beautiful ego. system when it yeah, works. It could be ego, it could be that a lot of times head football coaches were quarterbacks and they didn't really lift weights <laughs> and there's no appreciation for what you can accomplish and sometimes it's just the fact that they've never seen what can truly be accomplished from a strength and conditioning coach because there's so many aspects of besides just making big faster strong I mean that was easy but team building and all the other uh, character development yeah. you know, one, one of the things we used to do uh, every year is we did what we call basic training. It was calisthenics, okay, to develop our GPP, our general physical preparation. And the last day was our championships because we were the only ones who did this basic training. We called it the world championship. So the last <laughs> exercise was jumping jacks. So I don't care if it was snowing. I don't care if it was ice. I don't care if it was pouring down rain. I made them go and leave the weight room and go out on the street. And I said, gentlemen, we're coming out here on the street because we're going on the road. (laughs) And this is going to be our first win on the road. Mm -hmm. And I try to emphasize these little subtle things to teach them the importance of winning on the road. Come together as a team. You're, You're brothers. You're going to need each other. When you go on the road, it's all you're going to have. You're going to have to have each other's back. So we're going on the road, and we're going to get our first victory in 2019 today on the road. And the guys take their shirts off, and they're screaming and hollering. They're having a ball, but they're understanding. They're building that that competence. There, there's so many aspects of preparing a team to cover all the different uh Things that they're going to run up against, you know, and you gotta, you gotta prepare them because you get more time with them than anybody else. I remember you telling me years ago about your uh, what was it, burpees or up downs, whatever you may want to call them, mm-hmm. and how you, on one of the conditioning days it was. It wasn't very many reps. I think it was 30, actually. It might be seven. But right. Yeah. But tell a little bit about that, that yeah. story. Yeah, because they were on my cadence. Right. So I'm going, what I would do is I say, okay, we're going to go on a five count burpee on my cadence. I'll hit one, two, three, four. Oh, you moved. <laughs> we have to start all over again. And there were times we spent the whole two hours doing burpees because they couldn't understand how to get them right. I got a great story for you. Just thought I'd But the premise of that was to get everyone working as a team and being cognizant of what their instructions are. Yeah. I mean, mean, here's a great one for you strength coaches. Game day, all right, in the weight room. You you don't, the guys don't have the the mindset that you need 
in the weight room that day, all right? So I was at the University of Washington. Uh, I forget what other team was in there working out, but my baseball team was in there working out, and they were just going through the motions. I got mad. I'm like, this is not what I want. I said, every one of you baseball players, get your butts over here, put your toes on the line, take your hats off, sing the national anthem. And they went, what? And I said, start singing. Oh, and they started singing. And the other teams were looking over going, what are you doing? And I went, it's game day in the weight room. It's time to get serious. <laughs> so the, the players went and had a great workout after that. But, you know, it's just those subtle things. I mean, you know, every baseball game, the baseball players are going to stand up there and they're going to sing the national anthem. Right. Well, you I want a conditioned response. The music that you play in the weight room, don't play in the weight room, has to be set so there's a conditioned response. You're trying to get the players to play the very best that they can play, and you got to look at every aspect to make sure they're successful. Just remove as many negative variables as possible. Absolutely. How Absolutely. do you how do you walk that line then of creating this this perfect storm? And like Bert said, you know, you're removing all the negatives. Mm -hmm. How do you understand or qualify that you are not softening the kids yeah. rather well, than the toughening? No, no, no. Sometimes getting them to prepare for barriers is creating the barriers for sure, them. Sure, sure. Okay? So that you don't make it easy. I've seen strength coaches who never put their uh, athletes in a situation of failure. Right. And, they, you know, the biggest... Problem I see so many times with uh, lifting with football teams is before the first game, everybody thinks they're just strong enough. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then all of a sudden they line up against the other team and they go, oh. Because especially football players have a tendency to look around and go, well, I'm lifting more than 20, you know, 80% of everybody else in here. I'm strong. Right. Well, your 315 pound squat as strong as you might think that is, isn't very strong, right? right? Because the guy on the opposing team squatting 600 pounds is going to crush you, okay? Right. Yeah. Uh, and so this is where you've got to go and, uh, you know, my son watched West Side versus the world, mm -hmm. and he goes, oh my gosh, Dad, now I understand why you created all that competition in the weight room, why you created all that competition. Uh, uh, chaos and conflict in there because you're trying to get the players to be ready to play and make it competitive. He goes, you made it. You made everybody feel so uncomfortable in there. I'm like, yeah. Nobody was ever going to go and go. Oh, hey, I've arrived. I'm doing good enough. Yeah. And I never told the kids. I never told. Hey, that's good enough. You well, know? I'll tell you a story <laughs> in, in regards to that. Chuck Vogelpool. I trained yeah. with him. Yeah. And. If you don't know Chuck Vogelpool, just imagine intensity at its rawest, purest form, and not for show. I mean, dude doesn't have an Instagram, but has never had social media. He's an enigma within the powerlifting world, but he is he is the intensity defined. Mm -hmm. And I remember the same kind of thing with him. First day I trained with him, I'd I'd qualified a thousand pound squat at a meet. Looking at it, I knew it was. I, I didn't think it was good, but you know, it's in the books, right? Yeah. Um, You're not the judge. Right. So they hire people to do that. Go to uh, go over there and he goes, What do you squat? And I said, I was training with him at Lexon. And I said, I squatted a thousand pounds. He said, We're gonna find out. So we're working up and we get to like seven sixty five and dude is calling me at depth that is like to me at this point in time, like I'm thinking, Oh my god, this is insane. Well, I get eight hundred on my back and it is the most god awful struggle that you can imagine. Like it was, it was an earned 800 pound squat right. because there was a little bit of here's parallel and you're breaking it. And then there was, I'm going to make a point kind of thing. <laughs> um, and he made his point. So I stood up with it and I mean, I'm on shaky legs and I'm like, get in the rack. And he goes, 800 pound squatter. So next week we roll in there, dynamic work starts. 405, eight sets of three. He said, you can't go up until you do those eight sets of three right. And he was the same way too. He would, he would watch my reps and if they weren't perfect to his standard, mm -hmm. the rep one didn't count. <laughs> and if my 24 reps one through 24 weren't qualified, I didn't move up the next week mm -hmm. because I wasn't proficient. I wasn't distinguished mm -hmm. at doing that weight. Well, two months of this to the point where I'm like, this guy is, just hates my guts. Like he's never going to give me the, the, the go ahead. Mm -hmm. And then I remember it was like 
set six went by, set seven went by, and he's not bitching at me. He's not, you know, screaming or, or mad or anything like that. And he comes over, he said, you got to earn it. So I did those three as like perfect as I have ever felt I've done squats. Mm-hmm. And he walked over and he went, attaboy. Like, that is the biggest compliment that I have ever, I hung my hat on that attaboy in all of my powerlifting endeavors. That, it, it, that was no, the most. It wasn't in, just powerlifting how it affected you. No, hell no. It, it affected you as a man, didn't it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. completely. And like, because that's it why transfers I, to other areas of your life too. Somebody asked me about my, my defining lift and not trying to make this about myself, but somebody asked me the other day and it's kind of funny that that just came out. Because the other day I was like, I was trying to think competition, mm-hmm. but when I'm talking to a, to a man like yourself and I'm talking to Bert, I'm telling you the story of how it impacted me as a man, right. and that defines the lift that is the qualifying lift as a lifter. Yeah. It was 405 pounds for eight sets of three. Not the 832 bench, not the 602 bench, not the 1,000 whatever squat, that. Because it, I knew his standard was higher than mine mm-hmm. at that time, mm-hmm. and I met his standard. Yeah, That's, a, that's Wow. That's one of those powerful moments that if you can instill that in your kid or a, yeah. a, a player, oh. they will never forget you, but they will start believing in themselves in an Absolutely. entirely different way. Absolutely. After that moment, that's when powerlifting went like this for me. It went mm-hmm. straight up. Mm-hmm. So I totally get with that, man. Yeah. yeah. And that's what you want to you want to you want to you want to teach your your college football players from being boys to become men. Mm-hmm. You know, and I told, used to tell them, I said, you know, guys, you might think this is the hardest thing you've ever been through, but years later, you're going to come back to me and you're going to tell me, Coach, I thought that was the hardest thing I, ever, I would ever do in my whole life, but you, I found out that, Coach, life is, can be a lot harder. Marriage, children. I had one young man, um, uh, he got uh, wounded in war and sure. was on his deathbed. And he came to me, and they honored him by at the coin toss, let him, you know, call the uh, do the coin toss and uh, at the game. And he came over and hugged me and started crying. He goes, "I would never have lived through this if it wasn't for you pushing me through the workouts." Because I kept telling myself, "I made it through Coach Bill's workout. I can make it through this." You well, know, and that's what you want. Yeah. You want to have that impact on the. Well, I'll tell you what, what you've had an impact on me with this conversation, and this is kind of dangerous for me to say but when I'm talking to coaches I've almost got this outlook on them that it's like they're in they're in too deep that they can't see out it's almost like man where are you going with this Mm -hmm. you give me renewed hope in strength and conditioning at the collegiate level not that these other guys haven't Mm -hmm. but the diamonds in the rough the guys that get it at your level that's that's the only thing that some of these kids will ever have you know and I see that all the time in the youth in our area, whether it be absent fathers, yeah. fathers that are gone, uh, mothers that are working two jobs, whatever whatever the structure is, coaches, specifically coaches like yourself, that demand. They don't just let kids slide by because I think there's too much of that. Right. But coaches that put that standard there, that might be the only ha- hope that those kids have. A lot of them, you know, you're- So thank you for giving yeah. me that revision of what's going on. So many of the players never had a, a role model of a, of a father figure in their life. And they don't trust men. They don't trust right. old men because yeah. of it. And so by you going and telling them, hey, I want you to know, I'm asking you to do this because I love you. At first they're like, hey, I don't need your love. Uh, but you keep showing, hey, I love you. I want, and pretty soon they're like, wow, this guy really does care about me, mm-hmm. you know? And, and, and it helps them grow as young men and then hopefully become great fathers because of this you know right. two older. great role models yeah. themselves yeah. and coaches and mm-hmm. what's, wow. yeah. what's the future look like for you man oh i'm i'm a sore next guy <laughs> yeah. no you know what um a lot of this reflection has been able to come because i've been able to step away yeah. from it um you know, I understand what the, the strength coaches are going through because there's so many different little headaches that they have to deal with. Yeah. Uh, I, I, you know, I was listening to a game recently and I'm thinking, oh gosh, that guy was a pain in the butt. Oh my gosh, I kept thinking about all the troubles I had to put up with and all the recruiting presentations I had to do and all the, pe- the demands that people that really didn't have anything to do with the football program but were trying to place on me and I'm going, what in the world? How can I possibly have done all of that? You know, and people thought that 
Uh, I was, you know, back then, they thought I was investing too much of my personal time in my training. Yeah. And now my bench has gone, all, you know, gone crazy since then. I'm yeah. like, well, maybe now I have all this. Yeah. 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 Uh, one, I have more time to train. Two, I have more time to recover. You know, right. and I'm not pouring all this energy into a football team. You know, so it's been a reward for me. But I've been able to sit back and reflect a little bit more about what I was trying to accomplish, what my goals were, and um, and, and yeah, you know, I had great numbers. Uh, but the fact of the matter is, the numbers weren't my number one priority. Sure. My number one priority was the development of young men and the development of the football program. Absolutely. So, wow. Well, dude, I can tell you that this conversation, amongst the ones we had earlier today, um, we knew each other briefly. We've mm-hmm. talked over the years. It's been really a pleasure to be around you today because uh, I've been at every Squattober, and they've all been exciting. They've all been fun. There was a different dynamic of electricity in the room today, oh, and dude, it was it was all you. And I'm, oh, thank you. If you can't see this, I'm shaking his hand. <laughs> that was, it was great, man. Oh, and, thank you. And I think I'm, that's uh, a wrap, huh? Yeah, that, it's it's. There's going to be a lot more Bill Gillespie coming up. Uh, hopefully, this is a little bit of an intro to who this man what who this man is, and uh, he's super valuable to us. And you've been very valuable to, to me and my family for years. And thank you for being with us. And thanks for coming today. Well, I've always wanted to write a book, but I'm not a book writer. And Bert is the one I want to thank you because what you wanted to do, you and your dad, is is I wanted to give back to the strength world. And I didn't know quite how to do it. And you offering me to join the team with Sornex and doing all this has allowed me to give back together. You know, we can give back together mm-hmm. uh, uh, to to the world of strength training. And I, I think that there's some things that are going on in the strength uh, in, in world as far as with uh, athletics that are kind of going the wrong direction. Myself and several other strength coaches have felt that way. And... Um, I think that by, by by introducing and sharing all this information that we can show that there's a safe and effective method of developing strength that's applicable to the game that you're trying to train your athletes for. Absolutely. Yeah. Gets no better. Thank you for thank you for being with us, Phil, oh, thank and you. Uh, thank well, you guys for listening. You stay away from the microphone. You stay away from the microphones because you got a voice for this, brother. <laughs> <laughs> I don't need you in here pushing me out. You already got the biggest squat in the room. Hey, as always, I, I tell you guys, whatever you're doing out there, do it well. Stay strong. Love yourself and love somebody. Yep. Be legendary. Yep.